Can preamps degrade the sound quality of hi-fi audio systems? Let's find out. This is a recent system configuration of mine. There are three source components, a moderately priced NAD CD player, an EverSolo DMPA6 network streamer with built-in DAC and volume control, and a phono preamp that is connected to a turntable for vinyl playback. The output signals from all three source components are fed into a SHIT SAGA Plus preamp. Volume adjustments and source selection can be made using the included remote. The preamp output is connected to an Ellicott 300B tube power amp, which drives a pair of loudspeakers. Since all source components go through the preamp, signals from these devices are modified by the preamp. Transistors or vacuum tubes used to provide amplification add distortion and noise to the input signals. Noise from a poorly regulated power supply can also find its way onto the output signal. Well-designed and built preamps add very little distortion and noise to the input signal. Unfortunately, this comes at a high price. The April 2023 edition of Stereophile Magazine's list of recommended components includes a selection of Class A preamps. The most expensive is the Griffin Commander at US $67,000. The least expensive is the Shit Freya Plus at around US $1,000, depending on options. First, let's compare the distortion levels of each component as provided by the manufacturer. The CD player has 10 times more distortion than the preamp, so the additional distortion added by the preamp is negligible. The distortion of the preamp is 9 times higher than the network streamer, so routing the streamer through the preamp will add significant distortion to its signal. Please note that the specification for the Ever Solo is stated as total harmonic distortion plus noise not just total harmonic distortion. The phono preamp distortion is two times higher than that of the preamp, so additional distortion from the preamp is negligible. Now let's compare the signal to noise ratios of the components. SNR is also a good indication of a component's dynamic range, which is the difference between the loudest and quietest musical signals. By connecting the CD player to the preamp, its signal would lose 10 dB of its dynamic range. This could result in a reduction of headroom, affecting high signal levels, or an increase to the noise floor, which would mask low-level detail. By connecting the network streamer to the preamp, its signal would lose a whopping 16 dB of dynamic range the preamp would definitely degrade the signal quality of the network streamer's output signal. The phono preamp has a lower signal-to-noise ratio than the preamp, so the preamp will not constrict the dynamic range of the signal from the phono preamp. It seems the Sega Plus preamp is only suitable for connecting the phono preamp. Let's look at impedance considerations. Until I started reading technical performance reports of preamps by Stereophile Magazine and Audio Science Review, I never paid much attention to the subject of impedance. I knew output impedance of preamps should be low and input impedance of power amps should be high. Tests can reveal that output impedance varies over the audio frequency band, potentially causing dips and peaks to the signal at certain frequencies. If impedance is comprised only of resistance, the signal level will not change with frequency. Impedance containing capacitance and or inductance can act as frequency filters. The rule of thumb is that these frequency effects can be reduced if the input impedance is at least 10 times the output impedance. Without testing a preamp with various power amps, the actual effect of changing impedances on frequency response can't be verified. If bass frequencies seem to roll off steeply, is it due to these impedance effects or limitations of the loudspeaker? 
Amplifier manufacturers often only quote nominal impedance values. The only way to find out if impedance changes with frequency for a particular amplifier is to find a test report, if one exists. It would be frustrating to spend thousands of dollars on a preamp only to find that it doesn't interface well with your power amp. That's probably why manufacturers offer preamps that match well with their own power amplifiers. Audio Science Review performed a detailed technical analysis of the Shit Saga Plus preamp. It clearly shows the effect of output impedance containing capacitance on frequency response. To mitigate this base frequency roll-off, a power amplifier with at least 30 kilo ohms of input impedance is recommended. Elicit power amp, which was built from a kit, includes a schematic diagram of the circuit design. This shows the RCA signal inputs are routed directly to the volume potentiometer on the front faceplate. The resistance of the potentiometer ranges from a high of 100 kilo ohms to a low of 50 kilo ohms. Therefore, base frequency roll-off should not be an issue. Using the Saga Plus in active mode, I could not detect any difference in sound quality compared with the CD player directly connected to the power amp. In active mode, the vacuum tube can be included or excluded from the audio path. I heard no sonic change with the tube in the audio circuit, which was a bit surprising. Ultimately, I did not continue to use the Saga Plus preamp. To preserve the signal quality of the CD player and network streamer, it would be best to route them directly to the power amp. Swapping interconnect cables of three source components to the single input power amp can become tedious. Another option is to connect the CD player's digital output to the DAC inside the network streamer. This allows the EverSolo's volume control to adjust the sound level of music played from CDs. To adjust the volume level of music from the phono preamp remotely, I used the motorized ALPS potentiometer that was the subject of one of my earlier videos. The resistance of this potentiometer ranges from 47 kilo ohms down to 2 ohms. With the volume control of the power amp set to maximum, or fully clockwise, the resistance range of both potentiometers in series is approximately the same as using the single volume control. Swapping interconnect cables of two source components to the single input power amp can also become tedious. This inconvenience can be mitigated with an RCA switching device. You might be tempted to use a commercially available RCA switcher. This one is at least 20 years old. Back in the day when DVD players had RCA outputs for audio and video. Let's measure the continuity and resistance between the input jacks and the uh, output jacks. This has three sets of inputs and one output. So input one is here. the return you can see the resistance is all over the map let's try the left channel and let's try the negative contact Again, you can see a wide variation in resistance, and it's not stable. Let's open up the box and see what's inside. Well, inside we can see a, a slider switch, which is basically two contacts 
rubbing against each other. And this seems to be open to the elements, so dirt and perhaps copper oxidization might occur over time, making this switch uh, rather noisy. And interestingly, on the negative terminals there looks to be resistors in the circuit and that might be the reason why the resistance uh, is not zero and is uh, variable. Now that could be the because of the age of these resistors or that they're not very accurate perhaps plus or minus 20 percent. I built this two input one output RCA switch using four single pole double throw mini switches two sets of gold-plated RCA jacks, and a section of interconnect cable terminated into two RCA plugs. With a project that requires soldering wires to contacts, it's important to test the continuity and resistance between input and output contacts. I found it advisable to turn down the volume of the source components before switching inputs to avoid a power surge to the amplifier. To my ears, there is no sonic penalty with using this device. If you are contemplating building your own RCA switch, a wiring diagram prepared ahead of time helps avoid making mistakes. In summary, if you use a preamp, Make sure its noise and distortion levels are lower than the source components you want to connect to it. If you have high performance digital audio sources, consider connecting them directly to the power amp if possible. Avoid preamps with frequency dependent output impedance to avoid the risk of incompatibility with certain power amps. I hope some of these tips and tricks will help you improve the sound quality of your hi-fi audio system and enhance your music listening experience. Happy listening!